Ask any young World War II buff about tanks, and they will doubtlessly tell you about how cool the German heavy tanks were. You got your Panthers, your Tigers, your King Tigers. Immense steel beasts introduced in the middle of the war that terrorized the Allies who only had medium and light tanks. And to some degree, this is true. No other nation produced and implemented heavy tanks to the degree that the Germans did. America had Pershings only for a few months before the war ended, and the British really only had the Churchill, both of which lived in the relatively tiny shadow of the Sherman. No other nation, that is, except for the Soviets. The Soviets employed the Clement Voroshilov series of tanks to great effect in their Antifa antics, although in small numbers when compared to the ubiquitous T-34. At the time of their introduction, both the KV-1 and 2 were almost impenetrable, and their guns were on equal footing with, or superior to, anything the Germans brought with them. But as the war progressed, guns got bigger and armor got thicker, and by 1942 the KV-1 was starting to lose its edge. The T-34 was undergoing modernization trials of its own, and when you're trying to build a heavy tank, it's best to look at existing heavy tanks instead of trying to drag a medium tank into a higher weight class. While the KV-1 was starting to show its age, and the KV-2 was just a joke, the chassis still showed a lot of promise, and the Soviet War Department wasn't keen on trashing production facilities if they didn't need to. The decision was made to build a new heavy tank on the KV platform, and after a few iterations, the IS-2 was born. The kit on the bench today is by Zvyozda. Zvyozda is a Russian manufacturer and they primarily focus on Soviet or Russian vehicles. Despite the fact I'm essentially a full-on communist at this point, I was never really fascinated with Soviet tanks the way I was with German or American tanks. I bought this with the intent to do it up in the livery of the Stalin from Girls in Panzer, but through my research I came to a much greater appreciation than I had before. I took a really deep dive and learned a ton for this one. So break out your Adidas track pants and get ready to invade a Balkan state, we're building an IS-2. So I don't speak Russian and Zvezda has an impossible consonant cluster, so from now on I'm just going to be saying Zvezda. The contents of the box are three sprues of olive drab plastic, two identical sprues of metallic silver vinyl, the instructions, a tiny decal sheet, and this little jar I wasn't expecting. Because I speak God's chosen English, I don't know what this says. Turns out it's cement. The hull is not molded bathtub style, requiring us to assemble the hull plate and walls. After fiddling with this for a while, I finally understand why it's not done more often. In my example, the base plate has warped. Not a whole lot, but just enough to make attaching the walls a real pain. I grab a scrap piece of square stock and glue it to the bottom, clamping it to my bench while it dries. After that, I can carefully glue the port side hull wall in place, using green tape to keep it all there. I started working on the starboard side hull and undercarriage while the floor was drying, but we'll come back to that later. The upper deck is where we'll find the more interesting features of the tank. The most prominent feature in the front glacis is the driver's vision slit with adjacent headlight and siren. The example provided is the second pattern of bow casting. The first pattern had a distinctive step and a hefty vision door inherited from the KV tanks it was based on, but this was changed in 1944 to better deflect or absorb incoming rounds. The bow was cast steel 100 millimeters thick, but being angled back 60 degrees from vertical gives it a ludicrous effective thickness of 200 millimeters, or almost 8 inches. This was more than enough to stop rounds from the Tiger's deadly 88 millimeter, as photos from a captured tank show. The casting texture on this piece is great. Soviet steelwork, and especially their castings, were hideous, and this representation before us is awesome. The front of the hull was all cast. Everything behind this gorgeously hideous weld bead was rolled steel plate. At this point, I started to notice the flash on the pieces. In fairness, it's mostly relegated to areas that would be invisible once assembled, but there are a few places it needs to be taken care of. The hood over the vision slit is supposed to slide nicely into this U-shape, which isn't present on the real vehicle. I very carefully removed this feature before cementing the hood into place. The driver would also have controls for a compressed air system and a fuel pump to start the engine. Since it's diesel powered, there's no need for spark plugs, so adding fuel and cycling the engine a few times is enough to start it. Speaking of, the engine was a 12-cylinder V2IS, capable of putting out 513 horsepower at 2,000 RPM, propelling the tank along at a sturdy 20 miles an hour. 
The engine deck has a massive set of louvers flanked by a pair of exhaust pipes and deflectors. The exhaust shrouds are unfortunately out of scale thick thanks to a fair amount of flash lining the end. These curves are meant to deflect the exhaust away from the air intakes, but apparently this only kinda worked. Starting with the IS-5, they just moved the exhaust pipes to the rear and that fixed the problem. These rectangular grills are for air intake, and the huge louvers in the back are passive cooling for the transmission case. The bulge in the center of the engine access hatch is to facilitate the large cooling system sitting on top of the engine. These two circles in the corners are filler caps for diesel. Interesting to note, there's another fuel tank by the driver, and these are the filler ports for that. The massive travel lock, or gun cradle if you're nasty, is mounted just above the transmission access doors. I'm used to American and German tanks of this era, so things here are backwards to me. The drive sprocket on most Soviet tanks was located in the rear of the vehicle, including the Stalin. The track is pulled around the sprocket, then to the return rollers, across the idler, and underneath the road wheels before returning to the sprocket once again. The idler at the front of the tank is the same as the road wheels, two steel wheels without tires. Each road wheel pair is mounted on a swing arm which is in turn connected to a torsion bar running through the bottom of the hull. Each are limited in their travel by a fairly massive bump stop. Unfortunately, I don't see any shock absorbers, so I'm willing to bet it was a pretty bumpy ride. The idler controls track tension and, unfortunately, I don't see any mechanisms by which the crew adjusted it. I can tell, however, that this feature, most likely a massive screw, moved in or out which pushed the road wheel in or out. Track tension on Soviet tanks is odd, but we'll come back to that later. The front fenders are wafer thin and period photos consistently show them beat to hell or just flat out removed. If you'd like to improve the look of them, you can cut them off and replace them with a slice of thin sheet metal. The sponsons are missing entirely, and that combined with the antiquated hull construction gives us an indication that this is probably an older kit. I carefully measure their width and length and cut them from half millimeter sheet styrene and glue them into place. The upper and lower holes don't fit together without removing a fair amount of plastic and using a lot of cement. The rear plate and front glazes both have a slight gap, so I fill them in with dissolved plastic. This is an almost empty jar of Tamiya Extra Thin that I've dropped a few scraps of plastic in, creating a styrene soup that can be used to fill in small gaps. The tracks are molded in four pieces of silver rubber. True to Soviet form, they are molded with two alternating types of track link, one with a guide tooth and one without. Studying my reference photos, this seems to be more common on IS-1s and early IS-2s, with later vehicles using only links with guide teeth, though some photos demonstrate crews weren't very particular about alternating every link. The tracks are not my favorite. They're overwhelmed by flash and do not respond to heat very well at all. The flash is simply too much for me to take care of, and in the end I just super glued the ends together. On top of that, period photos show Stalin tanks with a somewhat interrupted cleat pattern, where this is just straight across. They're fine, the other details are close enough, I don't know how many people will notice this. Still, if you're hardcore about Soviet armor, it would probably be best to upgrade these. The turret is molded in two halves, the upper and the lower, with the seam line right where the two halves were welded together in reality. Each half was a gigantic steel casting between 90 and 100 millimeters in thickness. The turret is very slightly asymmetrical with a nearly invisible bulge to give the gunner more room. Now is a good time as any to mention the weld beads all over the tank. Soviet welds are notoriously gruesome and the cheeks of the IS-2 are some of the worst I've ever seen. Look at that port side, it's disgusting. I love it. It looks ugly as all hell. The rear of the turret is adorned with a machine gun and a ball mount, a 7.62mm Degchirov. The fins radiating away from the mount tell us that this turret was manufactured by Ural Heavy Machinery Plant, also known as Uralmash. The mantlet assembly looks good, but the upper port side corner isn't notched, and this upper shroud doesn't have any locating features to keep it in its proper position. I had to resort to my reference photos because the section of the manual was absolutely useless in this regard. The mantlet was bolted, not welded, to the hull from the inside, and you can really appreciate the armor thickness when it's been removed. As far as I can tell, this hole on the port side is for the gunner's sight, and the hole on the starboard side is for the coaxial Degtsurov machine gun. The roof of the turret is made of rolled sheet steel as opposed to the cast steel making up the rest of the turret. The commander's cupola is a massive cast hexagon with six direct vision slits all around. The circle ahead is a splash guard for the antenna base. This four-bladed mushroom is the turret ventilator, a small fan mounted in the roof to expel fumes. These little doodads on either side are periscopes surrounded by semicircular guards. The guards modeled for the driver have held up just fine, but these two are horribly warped. 
All four are also missing their tops. The second hatch is for the gunner. I'm not sure what these details are, but if I had to guess, I would say a torsion spring to help get the door open and a hold open catch once you do get it upright. Mounted on the commander's cupola is a 12.7mm Degchirov Spagen anti-aircraft machine gun, better known as a Dushuka. 12.7mm Dushukas? Dushka. Dushukas? Dushuka. Like most Soviet equipment, it was crude and heartless, but rugged and dependable. As a testament to its dependability, it continues to be used in dozens of conflicts across the globe since its adoption by the USSR in 1938. The main attraction here is, of course, the 122mm D25T. This monster of a cannon literally tore German big cats to shreds. I'm gonna drop the reports in the description because they're astonishing. The ammunition was too large to be loaded as a single piece, though they did try, and so it was loaded as propellant and projectile. Everything about the ammunition meant that fewer than 30 rounds could be carried in the tank without dropping necessary crew members. The massive muzzle brake on the end of the gun has something of a checkered backstory. The first iteration had a single baffle as opposed to the double baffle we have in front of us. During testing, the muzzle brake exploded and shrapnel nearly killed Clement Voroshlov's son. This obviously led to a redesign and documents of the time note its visual similarities to the muzzle brake on Germany's Ferdinand. It was redesigned again in 1944 and that is the version we have on the table. The assembly and cementing process kind of buggered some of the weld details, and I have some gaps I needed to fill, so I fill them with Tamiya putty. Once dry, I use an X-Acto blade I turned into a tiny saw blade to re-engrave the affected weld beads. As well, the mantlet was difficult to keep in its proper place, so I shimmed the bottom with strip styrene and glued it in place. Normally, I prime my model with Rust-Oleum, but I ran out and all I could get a hold of was Krylon Color Max. It's not my favorite, but it gets the job done. Primer is important for three things. First, and most importantly, it helps the paint stick. Second, it helps me see any gaps or cracks like this one on the barrel. Third, since I use a mid-toned primer, that provides an excellent base for pre-shading with black and white. The Soviet Union used a shade of green called 4BO, which is slightly brighter and more saturated than American olive drab. Some people make it more yellow, some people make it more green. I don't know which is more correct, and color swatches from the era are somewhat contradictory, so I've just picked the one I like the most. Using two parts US dark green and one part German camouflage beige, I come to a very nice representation of 4BO. If you prefer Tamiya paints, use two parts XF62 olive drab and one part each of XF60 dark yellow and XF5 green. Both mixes come out to a very P green. That's P, not P. P-E-A, not P-E-E. -E. If your P looks like this, go see a doctor. Anyway, I really shot myself in the foot this time by not leaving things in sub-assemblies. I thought I would be fine since this undercarriage is fairly open when compared to previous tanks I've done, but that proved to be not the case. Hopefully the areas I missed won't be super visible. The tracks are primed the same before being randomly sponged with chocolate brown from Vallejo and leather white from Reaper. I apply a matte clear coat and the tracks are attacked with various rust-toned oil washes. This is essentially the same borrowed technique I used on the Panzer IV's muffler, and I think I can make it work for tracks with a little bit more tweaking. Because I'm a busy guy, I painted the tracks on different days and had a bit of trouble getting them to match. Unless you pre-mix or carefully adhere to a paint ratio, this will probably happen to you at some point, and that's why we should abolish the 40 hour work week. Normally I'd talk about the tools at this point, but Zvezda has only provided us with the bare essentials. Really, the only extras here are toolboxes and tow rings. The manual has a very detailed drawing, which does include the tools. A two-man saw on the port side, just above a sledgehammer. The starboard side is missing a shovel, and the rear deck is missing a pair of tow cables and some turnbuckles. We do have some periscopes, though, for some reason. These round features on either side of the turret are plugs for the pistol ports, and they look a little tall to me. There's an abundance of grab handles circumnavigating the turret for the benefit of all the passengers this thing will surely carry. The handles around the bottom don't have locating features whatsoever, but period photos show that placement wasn't exactly exact. The antenna is just a length of guitar string glued in place. An AFV isn't officially Soviet until you strap some external fuel tanks on it, so here they are. Each of the four tanks holds 90 liters of diesel, and unlike on the T-34, these tanks are plumbed into the main fuel system. This little nub is a marker light, and there's a similar one towards the bow. These parts are included, but not indicated on the manual. As well, four are required, but only two are provided. 
Roughly the first half of the housing is red, so I paint them with Vallejo Flat Red after an undercoat of Vallejo Metal Colors Aluminum. I also paint the headlight with aluminum. This is the best I can do since unfortunately it was molded opaque. This might be the smallest decal sheet I've ever used. It includes options for precisely one tank. 414 of the 7th Guards Heavy Tank Brigade. 414 was a real tank and appeared in a series of photos taken near the Brandenburg Gate, as well as this War Thunder trailer. Curious details to note are the lack of an anti-aircraft machine gun, the asymmetrical stripes on the mantlet, and the missing starboard fender. Additionally, the external fuel tanks have been dropped in favor of a few Soviet-issue unditching logs. The usual Soviet star is slightly obscured by a polar bear added to tanks of the 7th Guards after their campaign in Karelia. Soviet crews were fairly well known for hand painting slogans or mottos on their tanks, and we are provided one. Battle Buddies. Because I'm nearly out of Tamiya Gloss Clear, I grab a bottle of Vallejo instead. I slightly thin it with water and brush it on the areas underneath the decals. Once dry, I cut the decals loose and soak them in warm water until they can be slid onto the tank. They all go over areas with some degree of texture to them, so I massage them with a cotton bud soaked in Solvacet. Be careful with the bare decals, they aren't ambidextrous. With the decals firmly in place, I can begin painting the IFF, Identify Friend or Foe, markings around the turret. These showed up once the Soviets began the final push to Berlin and are meant to easily identify friendly units for aircraft. It's important to note that these markings were not universal, but they are kind of a trademark of late war Soviet vehicles. They were also hand painted in the field, so don't worry about making them perfect. 414 in particular had the stripes quite messily applied. I used white from Vallejo and made the genius decision to hand paint with low blood sugar. Additionally, I extended the roof stripe to the mantlet as the manual calls for, but none of my reference photos show this. To begin my weathering process, I mix up my 4BO again, but this time I add a few drops of leather white to make a very slightly brighter tint. I sponge it on the areas of the tank that would see the most wear, namely the fenders and areas the crew or riders would climb on. Once it dries, it's very subtle, but that's the point. For exposed metal, I use a 1 to 1 mix of German grey and neutral grey, carefully dotted on areas of heavier wear. For rusted metals in the area of most wear, I delicately paint flecks of chocolate brown. With all of my detail painting done, I can seal it all in with Tester's Dull Coat. Before I start with my oil washes, I decided now is as good a time as any to try out this enamel pen I bought and promptly forgot about. Since it's straight black, I only apply it to the darkest parts of the model, in this case, the grills and the louvers. The chisel tip works fantastic to get into the rectangular intakes, though it is just a hair too wide to fit into the louvers. For the pin washes on the rest of the vehicle, I mix up a dark olive drab and apply it to the recesses and around some of the more prominent bolts. I tried some dots and tones on the front glacis and engine deck, but I didn't quite like the look so I skipped them this time around, using only brown tones on the engine deck where boots might leave mud. I apply spilled fuel on the filler ports and external tanks by dotting on burnt umber and quickly pulling it down with a soft, dry brush. The exhaust stains were undiluted oil paints, namely lamp black, raw umber, and a small amount of aquamarine. The paint was massaged with a dry brush and cleaned up with a cotton bud. Undiluted oils take a long time to dry, so we can leave it like this for a few days and continue on with the next step. Getting the tracks back on with the hull assembled is a nightmare, but now that they're on we can attach the return rollers and get to work adding some sag. Soviet track tension is like the Wild West, as you can clearly see from period photos. Some are adjusted tight as a drum, and some are so loose I'm astounded they stayed on. I stuff some sponge in between the track and the sponsons and glue the track to the return rollers with super glue. Of course, once the cameras were off, they started to lift a bit, so I carefully added some white glue around the running gear. Three days later and my exhaust stains are appropriately dry to begin dusting the vehicle with chalk pastels. The process is very simple. Grate the chosen pastel over the model, compress it with a short stiff brush, wipe away the excess with a softer brush, and blow away the remainder with the airbrush. This time around I use earth tones sparingly and try to emulate urban dust over the majority of the tank. This step really unifies the entire color palette and I love the finished product. And that's the build! I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting a little bored of the slideshow that I just stick at the end of the video. Let's change that. That's better. I couldn't find anything specifically on the mount for the Dushuka. Dushukas? Dushuka. 
so I just glued it in a dynamic pose that looked good to me. To give you some idea how big this thing is, here are two contemporary American tanks in the same scale. This is a mid-production M4A3 Sherman armed with a 75mm cannon. This is an EZ-8 sporting a long 76. This thing is ogromni. Anyway, I'd like to leave a glowing review of the kit, but I can't really do that here. This one required a lot of work to get together, though the end result is undoubtedly pretty slick. This is the cheapest Stalin II on the market by far, and although I can't give it 10 stars out of 10, it is definitely a good bet if you're looking for something cheap to build over the weekend. So that was the uh, Zvyazda 135th IS-2. If you stick around this long, I really appreciate it. Um, the kit was okay, you know, not my favorite. Uh, there were certainly a lot of things that could have been done better, both by Zvezda and myself. This is uh, the first Soviet tank that I think I've ever done, and um, in my research, I did um, come to appreciate the Soviet tanks a little more, you know, growing up on History Channel, everything is T-34 this, Tiger tank that, and it just seemed boring to me in that regard. So the strongest possible thanks must be given to Peter Samsonov over at tankarchives.ca. Um, the information that he has compiled on that website is absolutely incredible, and this video would not have come out um, the way that it did. I did try and check out the Zaloga book on the IS series, but because the Postal Service is understandably going through a lot right now, um, that book has not yet arrived, and I requested it uh, a month and a half or two months ago now. I bet as soon as I publish this, I'm going to get a notification that it's ready for pickup. So, not necessarily my favorite build or even my favorite video that I've made, but, you know, everything is a process. This is just another step on the way to whatever I'm trying to do. <laughs> if you enjoyed this one, please leave a like, leave a comment, whatever. Um, I really, really do appreciate um, all the comments that I get because for the most part, they are in incredibly constructive and, you know, it just feels good to engage with an audience, you know? Um, if, if there's anything you guys want to see, just let me know. Um, Drop it in the comments, message me on Twitter, um, what kind of content do you guys want to see? And thank you to my dear friend Rachel, I've known her for a very long time. Um, she was the one who helped me with the pronunciation in this video because I don't speak Russian. And I certainly can't read Cyrillic. So, um, thank you, thank you, thank you to her. Um, she is currently raising money for Armenia. She has been to Armenia, and she is selling prints of some of the photos that she took. They are gorgeous photos. Um, I will drop that link down below. I will also drop some other links to charities and funds that go to Armenia. Anyway, I don't know where I'm going with this anymore. Well, I think that's all I've got for this one, so... Like, subscribe, comment, whatever you want to do. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, over... Here somewhere, probably, maybe. <laughs> please continue to be excellent to each other and please continue to take care of each other. Have a good night.